Welcome to Breaking Down Bergman. I'm David Friend. And I'm Sonia Strimban. And we're looking at the magic flute. Bergman has returned to the television medium to provide his interpretation of the famous opera, The Magic Flute. Um, and he's, of course, done it in a very interesting style, a very unique style. This is something I haven't quite seen in this way before. Yeah, I've never seen opera for TV for general public audiences. Done in this way. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the thing, is that there are plenty of productions that take the opera and literally put it on a TV screen. But Bergman had to, you know, get his little Bergmanisms into it and, and little like winks and nods at the audience uh, that made it fun. I, I think it made it fun at least. Yeah, there's definitely playful elements in it. Um, and, you know, the opera itself, Mozart is an artist in his own right. So having Bergman do Mozart is something that's very unique. I still struggled with it. I mean, you know, sometimes the collision of media can be interesting when you have opera um, kind of stylistic stage performance, um, pan audience shots, and then the whole TV framing of it. Um, it. It could have been interesting for me, it was just kind of busy. I, I struggled with it, to be honest. <laughs> There's a lot of anticipation about Bergman's version of the Magic Flute, which was shot on a film set of the Drottingham Theatre. It was sort of a recreation of that theatre. Um, but the film had gone over budget, and there had been a lot of speculation about it and how Bergman would bring it to the television screen. Um, and ultimately, we got this really unusual project, and I think that we have to start with how it opens. Because there's 10 minutes of watching an audience watch a play that we can't even see. And to add to that, I think it kind of sets the tone for how we are to appreciate it because the audience's facial expressions are very responsive to something that we can't see, but they're obviously taking in. And so it kind of programs you in a way of how he would like for you to approach what he's going to show you. The other thing that's really struck me about the audience is how diverse it is, both mm -hmm. in terms of age, gender, uh, ethnic diversity. We've never seen Bergman's uh, cast look like this in any other film. Apparently he went onto the streets of Stockholm and sort of hand-picked people out of the crowd to get unique faces and expressive faces and faces that maybe didn't have to make an expression but really said something to the viewer of the film. But what I really enjoyed about this opening is that it's such what Bergman would have done to remind the viewer that they're watching a film. But instead of the film reel running like persona, here we literally get the audience watching the play. One particular audience member stands out quite significantly, and it's a little girl uh, who has a very cherubic looking face. And she seems to be rather enthralled with the whole performance that she's witnessing. And for me, I'm not sure what that little girl really symbolizes. And the closest that I can come to an explanation is potentially the timelessness of the subject. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's something that you can observe when you're a child right up to when you're older. And it's something that can be, you know, created by one artist and reinterpreted by another. And it just can go on and on forever. And what's interesting is that the little girl is actually Bergman's granddaughter. So I thought when we were watching it and when I learned this afterwards that maybe this little girl is Bergman. Maybe this is Bergman putting himself in the audience and kind of giving us a glimpse of how he enjoys opera, how he feels about the theater, because the theater has always been a part of his life. Mm -hmm. If anything, it was the birth of him as an artist before he walked into film. Um, and it, I mean, even when he was making movies, he never left the theater world. 
So I just feel like this was a message to the audience. He wanted to be present in this moment as a viewer as well. Music, theater, and film have always kind of intertwined themselves quite powerfully throughout all of Bergman's films. And he's shown us, you know, symphonies in his films. He's shown us other musical performances. And we've actually seen the Magic Flute itself make an appearance in a previous film, the good old neurotic Hour of the Wolf. Um, and the opera was actually displayed as a sort of surreal puppet show in the film. In some ways, it almost seems like Bergman is a little bit obsessed with the Magic Flute. And so I wondered, well, what is this affinity that he has for the story? Why does he continuously return to this opera in particular um, in his films? Although I'm not very familiar with the Magic Flute, I think I can get a sense of what is appealing to him. And I think it's the extremes of human emotion and human relationships mm. as you go through the film. Um, you know, moments of sacrifice, moments of love, moments of self-doubt, um, moments of, you know, passion. Uh, and, and a lot of that kind of human one-to-one -one dynamic that he would find interesting both on a psychological level, um, on a, you know, kind of exploratory, experimental level. Uh, as well as in a performative level, because mm. it's those emotions that really help you to put a performance on. I think a lot of those themes are rather timeless. What I think he demonstrates um, by making the Magic Flute into a television production is that he truly understands the story, because instead of going in there, ripping it apart and reinterpreting it, making it a Bergman production, as, as some directors would, mm -hmm. he, he sort of tinkers with the little details to make it a little bit more contemporary, but all of his decisions are quite subtle. The change might seem subtle on the surface. For example, him changing the relationship between two of the main characters, Pamina and Sarastro, to be a paternal relationship making Sarastro Pamina's father. But I think the implications of that change are actually quite significant on mm. the overall interpretation of the story. So making it kind of a familial discord instead of a battle between good and evil. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe he's trying to make it more accessible to people mm -hmm. today and also more aligned with the television medium. And it almost speaks to Bergman's focus on the family and the relationships of people that are related, which really seems to be what he wants to do in the 1970s. We've seen it many times, whether it's a marriage relationship or mm -hmm. actual family members by birth. Um, but this really fits into that change. The focus on the family is definitely noticeable here in the dynamics that he creates. But I think it's interesting that he does choose a medium like opera to talk about some of these things. And maybe it's kind of his dramatic flair to show us the heights to which some family conflicts can go to, that they can have this elevated operatic, almost comical you know, e extension to them. Mm -hmm. And that is reflected not only in kind of the subject matter and the presentation style of opera, but also just in the way that he puts some of the sets together. There are some comic relief elements and some interactions between the actors and the kind of transparency that he's shown us before, which is interesting too. Yeah, Bergman starts the play literally as we watch the curtain rise and the camera moves into the set. And he never hides the fact that this is an opera on a stage. Aside from watching the audience watch a play as, as the film starts, we see the set changes, literally. At the middle of the film, there's an intermission where we head behind the scenes to watch the actors. And I think that's the most hilarious part Taking of this. Taking a smoke break. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Taking a smoke break, just kind of messing around. Um, it shows that this entire structure of this film is fake. And I thought Not that- Not only that, but I think it also kind of shows Bergman maybe poking a little bit at the genre of opera, which is supposed to be like really, you know, elevated, really mm -hmm. highbrow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's saying, not only am I putting it on TV, which is kind of, you know, the boob tube, if you will, but I'm also going to show you that these sophisticated, you know, aureatic performers are just the same as any other person in a costume, you know, scratching and smoking behind the rafters. So would you say the magic flute is essential Bergman? No, I, I think it's, I think it was an experiment. I mean, if you're a very avid Bergman fan, you could watch it, but I would recommend a pass. I have to agree as well. Now, there are some facts that make me sort of lean towards it being essential in that Bergman was a passionate uh, director of theater productions, and this gives you a bit of a glimpse into that. But I think that we've been here before in other ways, not quite as literal as The Magic Flute. 
but um, I don't really know if this offers all that much more of a revelation of how Bergman thinks. But it is fun, and if you like opera, this I think will be very enjoyable for you. For the rest of the viewers, perhaps not. That brings us to the end of this episode of Breaking Down Bergman. Join us next time when we are looking at the film face to face. And in the meantime, you can head over to our YouTube channel. Or check us out on Facebook. And we will see you next time on Breaking Down Bergman.